Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I want my wife to stand up for one second. This is my wife, Anita. Give it up for Anita. Thank you. She is so hot. I totally scored. She's beautiful. Um, my name is David Watson. I am from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my actual address is in Brentwood. It's just a suburb of Nashville. Um, Here's my email address if any of you all want to email me. Uh, I'll be glad to try to do whatever I can to help you uh, going forward. It's um, a pleasure to be here. I, I want you to know that um, I don't know how to work this thing. <laughs> Which one's the forward button? Oh, that one. Okay, got it. There you go. I want you to know that I flip hamburgers for a living. And this is a great story, and I'll start off by telling this. But before I do, let me, let me give you five things I hope you take away from today. Um, one is, we can all do hard things. I hope you get that today after I tell my story on how I became a franchisee and, and the things that I do now. It was not easy. We can do hard things. Um, the second thing I hope you take away is I hope for your careers or your entrepreneurship ventures or whatever it is you do, that you do something you really love. I think that's very important. The third thing and principle I want to teach you today is that you cannot swim across the lake with all the gold on your back. You can't be selfish and be successful in business. You have to give back and help others. Um, another thing that, that I hope you take away is that something that my friend Scott Peterson taught me is that faith is more important than money. So never let money push faith to the side. Make sure your faith is always number one and money is number two, or wife number two, <laughs> money number three. Um, and the last thing that I wanna teach you today is, is something really important to me in my life, and that is how to have balance in your life. So the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, me flipping burgers for a living. It's, it's, I know a lot of your parents have said to you, if you don't straighten up and go to BYU, you're gonna end up flipping burgers for a living. Well, it's okay, I love it. I love hamburgers, and I haven't mind doing it. And that's what I do for a living. I love it. Look at the love. Get that? Um, I'm a franchisee for Sonic Drive-Ins, like Scott said. I own 25 of them currently. And every day is fun for me. I just enjoy what I do. Um, it's a fun business. It, it's never boring. Um, I really enjoy it. Plus, I love to eat. So that's why I love doing Sonic. A little bit about Sonic. Um, Troy Smith started Sonic back in the 19... In 1953, he was born in 23. In 53, he started it, but it was called the Top Hat Drive-In. And he had little speakers out front so you could push a button and take your order over an intercom. And then he's the one that thought of the idea of service with the speed of sound, so he named it Sonic. So in 56, he started calling it Sonic. In 58, he started franchising it. Um, I was born in 1959, so the timing was perfect for me um, as a one-year-old. Um, but um, I tell you, he started it and, and started selling franchises. And like so many of you know, as you study the franchise business, that's hard to do. Because all of a sudden you have a Sonic in Mississippi or a Sonic in Tennessee, and he was in Oklahoma. And how do you make sure that they're all run proper and that they're all run the same? And that was really difficult. How do you purchase all the same products? How do you advertise together? And I have a cute commercial that I found. This is the first commercial ever made by Sonic, and you're going to love it. Seth's going to start it for me. I tell you, that was, uh oh, what happened? That was a funny commercial. But the problem that Sonic had back then was consistency and advertising together and, um, and doing all that together. As you all know, now we have uh, the two guys. Anybody seen the two guys on TV? Do you like them? Yeah? 
No? Yes? I don't care if you do or not. They are working. They are selling hamburgers. Um, I think the next slide is probably a commercial. No, here's a menu, uh, an old menu of Sonic back in those days when, the, when that commercial was made. It, uh, hamburgers were 35 cents at Sonic, quarter pound like hamburger. Prices, yeah. So that was a long time ago for sure. Um, so after this commercial and, and they tried to figure things out in Sonic, they had, we had a CEO called Steve Lynn who came and brought the company together and, and decided to start co-oping and working together and buying the same products. And, uh, and what happened is when that happened in the 80s, Sonic really took off and started to be successful. Because when you went to one Sonic, it was just as good of an experience as you went to another. Um, I compare my competitor that starts with the M word you know how you can get a crappy M McDonald's burger anywhere? They're all the same. They're all no good. Same, same, same concept, except we try to do a better job of, of our product. Um, in the 90s, our, our Sonic was traded publicly, and today there's over uh, 3,500 units. And the other thing that Steve Land did was he tried to get us all to retrofit to make all of our stores look the same. Well, I graduated from BYU in 1984, the year of the national champions. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, after, after BYU, um, I was fortunate enough to get involved in Sonic as it was uh, propelling itself upward. And that's what a Sonic looked like uh, in our first retrofit series. That's kind of what they look like now. There's a night shot. Now here's a commercial of the two guys I want to tell you about. I've met these guys in person, and they're just as stupid in person as they are on TV. I don't think they're acting at all. I think they're really this dumb. Seth? We'd both be equally uncomfortable with our names being associated with the word celebrity at all. <laughs> well, that was 10 years ago and probably not the case anymore. No, these two guys are more recognizable than ever. Still behind the wheel of Sonic success. Where's the all the way? 50 cent corn dog away! He's gonna give you that certain uh, je ne sais quoi. Je ne sais what? Jenna. Come on, man. Did she mention me by name? Can we go way back? Yeah, plus you're like 60, right? No. God, you're off by about 20 years. But you're 80? Mm -hmm. The other way. You're 80? Double check. Up there. It's a check. Yeah, I know. There we go. All right. Good. Ball in. One more time. Come on. Quick check one. Here we go. I should check, check that. Oh, really? Sure. There we go. Wait a minute. Sooner started? Yep. Whoa! It's so great that Sonic has half price shakes for St. Patrick's Day. Come on, I forgot to wear something green today. Why, Janine? Because mm -hmm. she reminds me of my ex-girlfriend, Janine, who was nuts. <laughs> There's a hot dog in here! It's like a Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> a waffle, waffle, waffle cup. Reese's peanut butter cups and chocolate. And real strawberry. Oh, you make strawberry sound intense. Lots of little oils, but strawberries very densely packed with vitamin C. Burn alert! What is the L stand for? Lunch. Pretty sure you can't litter in lunch. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was fast. Yeah, I think I'm proud of a blue out of me. Thing. I paid for these cheeseburgers. Great, so we're finally jointly. Well, oh, I don't know. This is how you Sonic. Thank you. That's pretty awesome. These guys are working for us. We had them for a few years and then um, decided to go to just food shots in our commercials and, and other items. And the demand was so great that we had to bring them back and now they make like tons of money working for us. So it's been a lot of fun. I want to tell you my story if I could. Um, and when I talked about uh, we can all do hard things, I want to just share a, a little personal bit about my life. Um, I was born in Las Vegas and the uh, parents that had me so you have to keep track here. The two parents that had me um, couldn't keep me. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into why, but it's a long story. So these two people adopted me. And my dad who adopted me said he was playing craps and lost and had to take me. So here I am. <laughs> so my two parents that uh, adopted me ended up divorcing. And I lived with my mom who married three more times. So if you're doing the math, you know, that's about seven, three, four, five, seven parents. And then um, after the third husband of hers, my dad went to court and I was able to go live with my dad with his new wife. And uh, she had four children of her own. So all total, I have eight parents and 35 stepbrothers and sisters. Oh. And um, my life was colorful as a child. 
Um, I remember the abusive situations personally. I also remember the abuse between my parents. And I, it just wasn't a good thing to remember in my, my childhood. But I, I made it through it. Um, I grew up in high school in Mississippi. Anybody here from Mississippi? Nice. You from Mississippi? I served there. You served there, but you're from Mississippi? Yes. Somebody from Mississippi made it into BYU. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Oh my gosh. Hey, Mississippi ranks number 52 in academics in the US. So, <laughs> right? It's so bad. So, so I, I grew up in the Delta of Mississippi and, um, and my GPA, my first year at college at a university was a 1.4 GPA. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, this isn't for me. Um, so I went to work for Sonic and traveled all around the country opening new Sonics and whatnot. And then, and then I, uh, I ended up going on a mission for my church. And after my mission um, is where my life really changed. Um, on my mission, I learned how to study. I learned how to uh, plan and organize. And I just learned so much on my mission. I was so blessed. But when I got off my mission, um, I went when I was 21 years old. I went to speak French in Quebec, Canada. Any Quebec missionaries? Sweet. Try speaking French with a southern accent. It was horrible. <laughs> so French was really hard for me, but I was able to do it. Um, and I, uh, I learned a lot on my mission. So I, when I got home from my mission, you know how you report to the high council and you give a little five minute speech and then you bear your testimony in, in horrible French? And, um, and then you shake everybody's hand. As I'm going around the table shaking everybody's hand, the final hand to shake was my state president. And instead of saying, good job, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or whatever they say, he shook my hand and slid a piece of paper in my hand and said, call my daughter. I'm like, yes, president. There she is. Thank you, thank you. I was an obedient missionary, and when I got home, I was obedient. That's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. The thing, the thing that, that changed my life about Mary and Anita is her dad was a surgeon, an ophthalmologist. Her brother's a psychiatrist, and her sister married an attorney. And I flip hamburgers for a living. So imagine the stress that I had going into that family. And I knew that I needed to be successful. So with Anita's help, and, and you guys will not believe this, I know I said I had a 1.4 GPA. But I got accepted to BYU on probation at night school in 1982. And um, I ended up finishing BYU with a 3.0. Oh, I think I have slides here. I get so far ahead. This was my first Sonic that I worked at in high school. So in high school, I actually worked at a Sonic, and this was it right here. This is me. Check out the do. <laughs> See how chicks digged it? <laughs> they love my hair. Uh, that's me getting ready for my mission at a Sonic. I actually left Sonic for a while and went to work for Wendy's, thinking that I would uh, check out the competition and, and maybe I would learn something. And I did learn a lot at Wendy's. Um, had a really good experience there. Um, I proposed to a girl in the walk-in cooler on Box of Frosties. That didn't work out. Thank goodness I have my wife now. Um, I did go on a mission. That's me, the skinny guy on the left. Um, and then I was telling you about my wife. After my mission, I, I, uh, I did what my state president said, and we got married in Los Angeles in the temple, and best thing I ever did. I came to BYU. I graduated in 1984, uh, here in the Tanner Building, actually. And then I went and got an MBA from Memphis State University. Now, you're probably asking yourself, so he loves Sonic. He's going to flip hamburgers. Why an MBA? My MBA taught me how to think and how to make decisions and how to analyze and, and, and think through situations. and problems. It really taught me so much. I'm so glad that I did that and I have my degree to, to lean on. After I got my MBA, I'm like, okay, I'm a stud muffin. I have an MBA. I want to wear a suit to work. I don't want to flip burgers anymore. I'm going to show my father-in-law. So I got a real job at Holiday Inn in Memphis, Tennessee. We got one Memphian up here, right? Somebody from Memphis. I, I thought somebody was. Um, anyway, I got a job at Holiday Inn Corporation in the food and beverage department, and it was the worst nine months of my life. It was horrible. I absolutely hated it. And I think the reason I hated it is because I had a boss. 
And I, and I had a problem with that because I'm, I'm ADHD to the 10th level and I just don't know if I could handle the whole boss level and, and, uh, and everything that I went through. So it was really tough working at Holiday Inn Corporation. So I talked my wife into letting me go back to Sonic. And this is a really cool story. We were in Memphis and um, I was making $400 a week. How sad is that? That was my salary. And we decided to go to the temple in Atlanta. That was the closest temple to Memphis. So we took off on a little road trip, she and I, and we were praying about what we should do um, because I was so unhappy at Holiday Inn. I loved Sonic, but really, could I make a living flipping hamburgers? And could I support a surgeon's daughter? Uh, and and that, that concerned me. So we were going to the temple, and we drive through Nashville, and between Nashville and Atlanta, there's a big mountain, and there was a snowstorm, and so the mountain was closed, and we couldn't get through that pass. And so it's called Mon Eagle, the pass says. And we, so we stopped in Nashville and got a hotel room. And while in Nashville, we thought, well, let's go eat at the Sonic here. So surely there's a Sonic. So we asked somebody where the Sonic was, and they said, oh no, there was a Sonic in 1972, but in 76 it closed. There was a drug dealer who was the manager and it was a bad thing and, and so it became a drive-in liquor store. I swear it's a true story. You could pull up and get liquor <laughs> in a car. I didn't understand that. So, so we went and we found it and this is what it looked like. This was the Sonic that we found and we pulled up and I went inside the liquor store, you know, nice return missionary going in the liquor store. And I walked in and I asked the, the owner um, if he was interested in selling. And to my surprise, he had just got caught selling liquor to a minor in a car and um, was about to lose his license. And so he said, yes, I would be interested in selling. So I offered him $150,000 for the land, the building, and any junky equipment that he still had in it. And he said, yes. I'm like, oh my gosh, I make 400 a week. Where am I gonna get money to buy what I just offered? So I went to Sonic Industries and I told them that I had the experience, that I knew how to run a Sonic, and uh, I was looking for investors. I ended up with three people to help invest. They each put in $65,000 each, those three people did, and we reopened it and remodeled it and made it look nice. And um, for, for, the, for my efforts, for my sweat equity, I got 40% ownership of the business. So remember the part I taught you about that I mentioned earlier about not swimming across the lake with all the gold on your back? Sonic had a really good model in the 80s and the 90s, and that was the managers would put in sweat equity and get ownership. And I've used that model my whole career. I've used that model where I don't own 100% of any of my stores. I own a percentage of it, and then I have other partners. Most of them have aprons on that, that have ownership in the stores. And it really has helped my business a lot, having that ownership mentality from a management level. So anyway, I became, a, uh, I became the manager using my sweat equity. I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. Anita, bless her heart, we had a daughter at this point, And we lived right behind the Sonic. There was a graveyard be be between our, our apartment and the Sonic. And so my sweet wife and daughter would have to walk through the graveyard to come to see me at Sonic. And there were many nights when I would spend time with my daughter and my wife would run the Sonic. So we really had to do something really hard and that was taking a broken business and turn it into something successful. We were able to do that, turned it back into a Sonic and it became extremely successful. Um, it was uh, a number five in the chain at one point in time in Franklin, Tennessee. And we just loved it. We had a good experience there. I was able to, I was able to run that Sonic for four years and then I was offered sweat equity position in two other stores if I would supervise them and help take care of them. So I had 40% ownership of, of the Franklin store and then I had 10% ownership of another and 10% of another. And I, then I was able to go to a bank and I'll never forget, I put on my best Sunday coat and, and I went to several banks and I finally found a banker that believed in me. His bank wasn't far from the Sonic and he saw what we could do. So I found a piece of land in a nearby town. It was $35,000. And then to build the building was about $200,000. And then another $150,000 for the equipment package. So I needed to borrow $350,000. And all I had was sweat equity in a couple of stores. This banker loaned me the money. And I was so excited. I bought the land, built the building, hired a manager. 
and then we opened. And something happened that day that probably turned my whole career around and how I look at things. We opened the doors of this little bitty town, a Sonic Drive-In, and you would have thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was amazing. It was like Krispy Kreme here when it opened. There were lines down the road. You remember that, Scott? They probably don't remember that. But um, there, was, there was a line. I had to get a policeman to come help control the traffic because everybody wanted to eat there. Well, here's what happened. We opened the doors, turned the lights on, and it was a total disaster. People were waiting 30 and 40 minutes for a hamburger. When lunch was over, I turned the lights out and cried. I literally cried. I was bawling in the front of my store. And all the little car hops were coming up. Oh, it's okay, Mr. Watson. It's going to be okay. But I was bawling because I'm thinking I'm bankrupt. I am so bankrupt. I'm back to holiday ends. Here I go. Um, but as it turned out, we figured out where our bottlenecks were, and, we, and we, we changed the way we did things. We took 12 employee cars and plugged stalls so people couldn't park there, so we could handle the 12 that did park there. It was a brilliant idea. Um, <laughs> so people thought we were smoking it, but there were only like 10 customers out there the whole time. But uh, I was able to handle it. And the next year, the next 12 months, I built six more stores and had so much fun doing it. I figured it out. I learned how to deal with contractors, uh, purchasing real estate, insurance, attorneys, uh, financing. I learned a lot. Um, again, I was working 100 hour weeks, but I was, I was in that mode where I needed to grow. At that point, I was able to hire a manager for my first store. And um, let me tell you, when you see a fast food manager, don't make fun of them because a lot of them make pretty dang good money. And I'm gonna show you one slide. This is a profit loss statement. Does this have a pointer on it, Seth? No. Okay. Just go back. So this is a that's fine. There it is. Just the top button. Okay, got it. This is a profit loss statement of a Sonic uh, in Brentwood that's real close to our house. And if you'll see for, for this year, 2013, I should have put 14s in there. 14 is actually better than this one. But in 13, we did $2 million in gross sales, uh, 1.8 after taxes and discounts and everything. But I want you to look at this line here. My manager, my partner, Sally, how sad is that? I pay $26,000 a year. That's all we pay our managers. You get $26,000 a year, but you get a part of the profit. You get 20% ownership of the profit. So this manager made $26,000, plus we, they get insurance, they get a, a car allowance, phone allowance, and all that. So if you look down here, this store made $360,000, $7,000 in profit this year. This manager, bam. Huh? I flip burgers. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so the Sonic manager, one store, makes $70,000 plus $25,000, almost makes $100,000 a year managing a Sonic. So I love flipping burgers. I don't know about y'all. I have had a great career in Sonic, and, and it's been amazing um, to be able to build them and to be able to see people's lives change, people making $100,000 a year that don't have MBAs and that are out there uh, working really hard, taking care of our customers. It's been an amazing uh, process for me to go through, and it's just been a blessing in my life. The thing that I want to make sure you understand about this blessing that I've had, that I have a goal and my goal is to pay a million dollars in tithing one year. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be the coolest thing ever? Would you like to pay a million dollars in tithing in a year? Yes, I would. I think that, I think my, my understanding of, uh, of the importance of my faith and how important it is that I serve, a quick story about that. When, when I was working 100 hours a week and um, opening that, that liquor store back into a Sonic, the bishop called me into his office and said, I, I won't give you a calling because I know what you're up against. You're going to do 100 hour weeks. And I told him, no, Bishop, let me have it. Give me a calling. I'll do it. And he gave me the calling of a ward mission leader, which if you think about it, was brilliant. The missionaries ate at Sonic every day in my town. <laughs> and so we had six correlation meetings a week because they were out on the patio eating at Sonic every day. It was brilliant. And, uh, and then I, my wife was able to come help me when I needed to go and, and, and do whatever. The other thing I did is, I don't know if you're familiar with Chick-fil-A, but they close on Sundays. And I begged corporate to let me close on Sundays, but per the agreement, I cannot do that. But I, I always made sure I went to church and tried to keep the Sabbath day holy. 
I hope y'all heard that this weekend from the brethren, how important it is that you keep the Sabbath day holy at church and at home. And I tried to do that, and I put faith in, the, in my Lord that he would take care of my business if I did what I needed to do on Sundays. We also had a very strict uh, policy in our stores that if you wanted to go to church, you didn't have to work on Sunday. So sometimes we had skeleton crews on Sundays, but we made it work, and I think the Lord has blessed me for doing that. So we talked about doing hard things. Imagine growing up with, in my parents' situation, growing up in Mississippi with no education and being able to get an MBA and have a successful franchise business. It's, it's, we can do hard things. And I know each one of you has difficulty in your lives right now. I know you do. There's something in there that is, that is tough for you to deal with in your mind and in your heart. But get through it because you can be successful. Don't let anybody tell you you can't be. Uh, that's important. The other thing, you can see how passionate I am about my business. Make sure you do something you love. And um, the other thing I want to teach you, if I could, is, is about balance. I think it's real important that you find balance in your life. And this is hard to teach BYU students because right now y'all are in school and probably working. And so it's hard to have complete balance in your life. But what I was taught at your age was to strive towards this. It's just like becoming, trying to be perfect in the gospel. None of us are going to be like our Savior and be perfect. But we can all strive forward, to, strive towards it. And same thing I want to teach you with, with having balance in your life. I think this is so important of a message for you to get. Um, I, I divide our hamburger. That's not a pie. That's a hamburger. See how I love this? <laughs> I divide that into four pieces. And the first piece, of course, is what you're going through right now, education. And later it's going to be your career. Don't mess that up and make that too big of a piece of your pie or hamburger. Make, make sure you try to keep that in balance. Now, there's times when I had to work 100-hour weeks. So... So it actually came to about here. You know, all that was my career. There's times when you have to do that because we have to do hard things sometimes. And, and, and I was in that situation. Right now in school, you're like that. You have most of your balanced will is, is because of school. So I think you get my point. Um, you're at BYU. You're having fun, but you're spending a lot of time here. I was so glad. By the way, can we talk BYU football for a minute? Is Bronco in here? Bronco? No. <laughs> My wife and I have been to seven BYU games in the last three years. It's hard being from Tennessee because they're all out here. We were 0-6 till Friday night. We had a victory Friday night. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Against Connecticut, I know, but I'll take it. Uh, so we were at Michigan last week. Oh, my. So anyways, I know, I know that you're here. I know it's busy, school and all. So I know your careers will be busy at times. But make room for your family, y'all. It's so important that we make room for family. I think that's so important uh, that you give time to your family. I'll introduce my family to you. This is my son-in-law, Blake, right here. He married my daughter, Danielle. Danielle actually used to work for the Center of Entrepreneurs here. She used to be uh, with Don Livingstone and Linda Rich and actually helped run the center. But that's my daughter. But her husband could be the smartest girl, guy in the world. Smartest man ever to marry my daughter, right? Because he now has ownership in 25 Sonic drive-ins. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he has an MBA and just a great young man and loves my daughter. And they have four kids. Right here is only three of them. This is my son, Terry. He's 26 years old. And my sweet wife, Anita. But they have a fourth baby. There's three of them. Aww. Can I get it all? Aww. That's our latest. His name is Finn, F-I-N-N, -N, and he will one day play for BYU. <laughs> That's my grandson, Caleb. Um, he and I are really, really good friends. He's now almost eight, uh, but this is a picture he took at an Ironman competition, um, which I'll talk about when I talk about self. I've done, uh, I'll, in four weeks, I'll be doing my 12th Ironman in Florida. And uh, it's something I, I love doing, and it, it kind of motivates me. But that's Caleb, my sweetheart. I told you she was hot. That's how you can eat all those hamburgers, by the way. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I eat Sonic every day, so I have to work out a lot. Um, I want to mention church and or community. If you're not LDS and you don't have a church affiliation, you can always get involved in your community. 
Um, I just feel like it's so important that you don't lose sight of your faith. No matter how much money you're making, no matter how busy you are, make sure you take care of your church callings. Do your home teaching. Do your visiting teaching. All these things are really important. Pay your tithing, and the Lord will bless you for that. I promise you. Um, go to the temple, those of you that are in doubt, or go do baptisms. Very important. That's our little bitty, itty bitty temple. Isn't it cute in Nashville? <laughs> hey, but we'll take it. It's eight miles from my house, and we love it. My wife works there, and uh, we just really enjoy. Should I tell the Elder Chris Offerton story? I should tell the story. This is awesome. I have never told this in public. Elder Christofferson comes to Nashville, calls me as the state president. So he calls me in, and, and Elder D. Todd Christofferson asked me to be state president. I'm like, yes, president. He says, well, let me have your wife come in. He brings my wife in, and he says, I'm going to call your husband the state president. Can you support that? And she says, I'm mad at you, Elder Christofferson. I'm like, oh, man, I'm ruined now. It's over. <laughs> she says, I'm mad at you. My husband and I work at the temple, and now he won't be able to work at the temple. Isn't that cool? She stood up for me. <laughs> and he said, Sister Watson, you can still work at the temple, but your husband's going to be the stake president. So. so we love the temple. I hope you all love it as well. What a blessing to have in our lives. Uh, this is when I was bishop. I served as a counselor in the stake presidency for nine years, and then I served as a bishop for five years, and then now the stake president, and my wife calls herself the Nashville stake widow, so she has to sit by herself. But. I ref a lot of basketball. I used to play basketball five times a week, and I love basketball. And then I started getting hurt as I approached 50. So now I referee basketball. This was just uh, one example of getting involved in your community I want to share with you. Uh, this was a Special Olympics basketball that I was refing. So stay involved, brothers and sisters. Stay involved wherever you are. And here's my favorite. This, a lot of us struggle with careers and, and all that, but I struggle with this one because I love to play so much. Let me tell you the rest of the golf story. I live on a golf course, so I think I'm an okay golfer. So, by the way, that was in Dominican Republic, I remember I know, now. Right, it was right, at Punta yeah. Cana in Dominican Republic. Yeah. We're playing golf. It's the 17th hole, and I walk under a tree to get my ball, and a, a limb literally cuts my nose wide open. And so I've got a towel, a golf towel, keeping my nose like this. And he's like, no, 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 we're tied. We are not ending this game on the 17th. <laughs> He hits a three wood on the green, makes a putt for eagle on a par five, and makes me finish the hole. I get a six on that hole, and I lost the golf game. It's called competition. <laughs> I got blood on my. I can't believe. So I love to play. I, I love to play as this guy. I know this is. I've had three of those. Right now I'm driving a pickup truck, which I love. Uh, I'll tell this story too. My wife makes fun of me. I have a, a 2013 GMC Denali pickup truck that I drive, and it needed new tires, and then it needed new washer fluid, so I traded in and got a new one. <laughs> this, this is another true story. This is an X45 right here. Three weeks ago, my grandkids met me at the lake. They got out of school early. We get on my boat. I have an X45. We get on my boat, and I turn the key, and it doesn't start. The starter's out. So we bought a new X46. Those of you that don't. That's my son-in-law behind our boat. That is not me. Uh, that's my little grandson. We have motorcycles. See where I'm talking about? I have a real problem with the self category because I love to play a lot. I love to play golf. That's me and my brothers in, uh, in Scotland playing golf at St. Andrews. That's my sweet daughter, Danielle, who worked here at BYU. Uh, she's a three-time Ironman, my daughter is. She's got four kids, three Ironmans, and Mary's married a husband that has interest in 25 stores. We have a lot of fun together. She texted me before the class and said, let's swim on Thursday. So it's so much fun being with her and, and, and uh, exercising with her. We have a good time together doing Ironman races. So that's the balance wheel I wanted to share with you. It's the Dave Watson balance wheel. I hope you all all take that to heart. and. Uh, and maybe your lives will be better off because of it. You know, it's been great talking to you. I, I, I don't know what else to teach you about franchising other than I hope that story about the sweat equity helps a little bit, about finding investors, going out and finding people to help you start your business. A lot of you, this young man right here I was talking to earlier before class started, 
Some of us have rich uncles. Some of us have parents that will put money behind us. Behind us. Some of us can go to angel funds and, and do competitions here at BYU with your projects and, and get startup capital. Uh, there's venture capital thir- firms that will help you. There's lots of ways to fund your businesses. Mine was the hard way. I did the sweat equity, and, sweat equity and then I went and borrowed money from a bank. And that was a tough way to do it. But I sure have had a great career. I love it. And uh, I appreciate me taking some of your time. And I'm proud to say I flip hamburgers for a living. Thank you.